When I say estate planning, people are like, that's for old people. And well, certainly it is for old people, but it is for young people too, especially families with young children. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I had a young couple in my office and they asked, uh, if we die without a will, does that mean all of our assets go to the state and our children uh, go into foster care? And I said, uh, no, that's not how that works. Uh, but it does beg the question, what does happen to your stuff? What does happen to minor children if the parents die without a will? Well, you're going to find out the answer to that question and more on today's episode of Lawyer Up. Thank you for watching. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and get ready for another episode of Lawyer Up. Today, we're talking about estate planning, uh, probate law, and the probate process. We're going to be talking about why we have probate law at all in the United States, and then I'm going to walk you through the probate process. What happens when somebody passes away uh, and they go through that process with the court systems? Then we're going to talk about some estate planning tools and ways to avoid going through probate. Last but not least, I'm going to give you some tricks of the trade. If you can't afford to do a full estate plan, uh, there are some ways to title assets that you get the same effect uh, of avoiding probate and to transfer assets to your intended beneficiaries. Do me a favor. If you enjoy today's episode, hit that like button. If you want to know more about the law, subscribe to the channel. If you got something to say, you have a question, comment below. I try to respond to every single question and comment. And last but not least, please share me on social media. And remember, I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. If you need advice specific to your legal situation, then you need to lawyer up with an attorney in your area. So let's talk in general about estate planning. And that is simply the process of planning for the uh, distribution of an estate in the event of an incapacity or death uh, of an individual. Uh, and when I say estate, I'm just talking about the sum of a person's assets and debts. That's all that really means. And so when we talk about probate law or the probate process, that's simply the process uh, that a decedent's estate goes through, uh, and it's determined uh, what debts are paid and what net assets are then distributed to which beneficiaries. And so the first question is, why do we need probate law at all? And the answer is, uh, in the United States and every other country, there needs to be a way to transfer assets from the dead people to the living people, right? Uh, traditionally, we transfer assets, especially titled assets, by writing that is signed by the transferor. So if you're transferring a house, you sign off on it. If you're transferring title to a vehicle or some other asset, you sign off on it. Except that dead people, they can't sign things. So the need arose for a probate law to transfer these assets from dead people to living people. Otherwise, you have things going to waste. You'd say, yeah, that's old man McCracken's house over there, but he's dead. Uh, we can't transfer it, so it's just going to be dilapidated. You would have these dilapidated properties all over town from people who had passed away if there wasn't a way to move those properties forward to the living. So probate law does that. They take things out of the hands of the dead people's estate and they give it to the living people. Probate law also exists to help make decisions for people who cannot make decisions because they're under some sort of incapacity. And this can be an actual incapacity, like you're in the hospital, you're laid up, you're unconscious, uh, and you can't make healthcare decisions for yourself, or it can be a legal incapacity. And this usually occurs where the person's not necessarily in the hospital, uh, but maybe they have dementia or Alzheimer's or some other reason that they're not able to really make decisions for themselves in their own best interest. So the probate law system develops guardianships, custodianships, and we have powers of attorney to help these people out uh, that are under an incapacity, whether they can't make a healthcare decision or a financial decision or otherwise. So when we talk about estate planning, the idea is that you are making decisions 
decisions in advance of your death or incapacity as to who will step in and make decisions for you, healthcare decisions or financial, and otherwise uh, where your assets are going to go, who the beneficiaries of your estate are going to be. And some of the things that you need to consider uh, when you're putting together your estate plan is, of course, A, where do you want your stuff to go? And a lot of times it'll just be to your spouse and then to your kids in equal share. But the delegation of assets can get as complicated uh, as you want it to be. You also need to give some thought about who you want to administer the estate. And that is usually called the personal representative. Uh, and this is the person that's going to be put in charge of collecting your assets, inventorying your assets, uh, paying off any debts or claims against the estate, and then ultimately distributing the net assets of the estate to the beneficiaries as you have directed. In a will, people also will consider if they have minor children, who are going to be the guardians of these children in the event that both of their parents have passed away. That's something that you can definitely put into a will and something to consider. Estate planning also allows uh, individuals with large estates uh, to do some tax avoidance and to maximize their position so that they can decrease or eliminate inheritance taxes. And last but not least, when you use powers of attorney, it allows you to designate somebody to make healthcare decisions for you, to act financially for you in the event that you cannot act or make decisions for yourself. So let's talk about probate law and the probate process. And this is the laws that govern and the process an estate goes through uh, when an individual passes away. And this process can come with direction from the decedent or without. If it's with direction, we generally call that a will. And that's a written document. Uh, usually it's typed out. It's uh, signed by the maker. Uh, it's usually witnessed by one to three witnesses, depending upon what state you're in. And then it's ultimately notarized to be a valid will. And it's in this document where you say, uh, I want you to pay my last debts and I want so-and-so to be the personal representative. I want my assets to go to my three kids or my beneficiaries or whoever you may designate in your will. Now, if you don't have a will, it goes through basically the same process, but there isn't any input from the decedent. Uh, and in every state, if you pass away without a will, that state will, in effect, give you a will. They will designate where your assets go. Uh, this is called the law of intestacy. Uh, and essentially, the state provides the will. Uh, it'll say that if you die, your assets will go to your spouse and your kids if you have them. Uh, if you don't have a spouse or maybe your kids have predeceased, uh, it will go down to your lineal descendants. So if you have grandkids, it would then go to them. Uh, the intestacy laws then state, well, if you don't have any lineal descendants at all, uh, then the estate will go up and that would be giving your assets to your parents. But let's say you have no spouse, you've got no kids, no lineal descendants, and no parents. Well, then the laws of intestate succession start going outward. Your assets go to your brothers and sisters, and then to your cousins. Uh, and there's these big charts as to where the assets go. It is a very rare occasion where assets uh, can't go to anybody and ultimately go to the state. I've never seen that happen in over 20 years of practicing law. There's always some living relative somewhere that can inherit under the laws of intestate succession. So when we turn to the specific process, of course, first you have a death, and then somebody uh, will file some paperwork with the court asking for permission to administer uh, the estate. Attached to the petition will be the death certificate and a will, if any, requesting that it be admitted to probate uh, so that the court can approve it or deny it and then go forward distributing things according to the specifications of the will. From there, the court will appoint a personal representative. Sometimes this is called an administrator, sometimes it's called an executor, but it's the person who basically is in charge of collecting the assets, inventorying those assets, uh, and then paying claims or debts of the estate, and ultimately taking the net assets and distributing those to beneficiaries. In the beginning of cases, courts will also determine their level of supervision. There can be a little bit of supervision. This is generally referred to as independent administration or a lot of supervision where the court uh, basically has to approve everything the personal representative does. Uh, these usually occur in contested cases where people 
are fighting about assets or fighting about the distributions. And that's referred to as supervised administration. After the level of supervision is determined, and then the personal representative will inventory the estate. And they're going to list all of the assets and an approximate fair market value of all those assets. And they're going to file that inventory with the court. From there, the claim period arises. And this is the period of time that creditors have to file claims against the estate. And they're saying that the decedent, uh, when they were alive, owed me X dollars uh, and they should pay it to me. And this period can be anywhere from as short as three months in some states up to over a year and a half in other states. And a creditor has to file their claims within that time period to be valid. Now, the uh, personal representative can look at the claims and if they're valid, uh, they can pay the claims. Or if they contest them, there will actually be a claims hearing uh, where the creditor has to come in and basically prove up their claim. Otherwise, the court will strike it and it won't need to be paid by the personal representative. After all the claims are paid, if there are any uh, net assets left, then those are distributed to the beneficiaries. Uh, it gets interesting when you have an estate that's upside down, uh, meaning that there are more debts than there are assets. Uh, the law provides a specific order in which certain creditors get paid. And obviously not every creditor will get paid if the estate doesn't have the funds to do so. Now there are specific uh, exemptions that are allowed, uh, homestead exemptions, exemptions for maintenance, exemptions for minor children, those types of things. But the laws are different in all 50 states. So if you have one of those sets of circumstances where you're going through an estate and you're a spouse or, or a child, uh, or you're responsible for a child, uh, you definitely want to lawyer up and explore those types of exemptions that may be available to you. Ultimately, after the distribution of all the net assets, the estate is over or closed. And that's the basic probate process in all 50 states of the union. And now that you understand how probate works, let's talk about ways to avoid it because that's what most people want to do. And the principal way we do this is by and through a revocable trust. Now the concept of a will and a trust are very similar. They're writings that are signed by the maker. Uh, they designate to pay debts. They designate who the uh, personal representative or under a trust, it's called the successor trustee, who that is going to be uh, that's going to administer the estate. And then they designate the beneficiaries to which any net assets will go. That's how they're similar. How they're different is that trusts are administered outside of probate, which means they do not go through court. There is no judge supervising them. They are handled without court supervision whatsoever, unless they're contested. You could always sue somebody over a trust and get it into court. But ordinarily, trusts are administered outside of the probate process. This means that the administration is faster. There's no set claim period. So once you are convinced that all the debts are paid, you could move forward with distributing assets to beneficiaries. It's considered a cheaper means of administering an estate and it is usually much quicker than going through the formal probate process. Usually when I'm explaining a trust uh, to a client, I describe it as a bucket. We're creating this trust or this separate entity uh, that is a bucket. Uh, and then we put things into the bucket or we fund the trust. In funding a trust, you will title things in the trust name. Uh, you can do this with real estate by deeding your property from yourself to yourself as trustee of your trust. And that seems silly, but that's how you put something in the bucket and fund the trust. Now, when you pass away, this bucket is still there and your successor trustee comes along uh, and they take things out of the bucket and they use those things to pay your debts, to pay claims, uh, and then to pay ultimately the beneficiaries of your estate. But the big difference is no probate. And these documents can be as simple or as complicated as you want them to be. Uh, in a simple will and or trust, you'll see everything going, say, to the surviving spouse and then to the kids in equal shares. But you can put complicated parameters on them. Sometimes you'll see uh, shares only distributed at certain ages, that they get, say, a third of the estate at age 25, half of the remaining balance of the estate uh, at uh, age 35, and then maybe the rest of it at 45. Those types of provisions. I've even seen little old ladies say, I want to give $10,000 to my nephew, but not if he's with that no good so-and-so girlfriend of his. And I'm like, okay, lady, I'll put it in the documents, but we'll have to sort that out on the back end. 
So you can make these things as complicated as you want them to be or as specific to your situation as you need. Trusts can also be irrevocable or revocable. Now a revocable trust is what you normally see. These are trusts that can be amended or changed or even canceled. An irrevocable trust cannot be changed. So if you put an asset in an irrevocable trust, you have permanently given it away. You can't amend it, you can't get it back. And so you don't see a lot of irrevocable trusts. Where you normally see them is when someone's trying to get assets outside of their estate so that they don't have to pay estate taxes on them. However, uh, in 2020, the estate tax exemption for individuals is at about 11.5 million, which means it's about 23 million for a married couple. So if you have assets in excess of $23 million in your estate, A number one, congratulations, way to go. And B, lawyer up, right? You need to do some estate planning. You need to do some estate tax avoidance. Correct? So lawyer up if you have an estate in excess of the 23 million between you and your spouse. Otherwise, for the rest of us, there won't be estate taxes due or any death taxes due on our estate. So as a general rule, trusts are considered superior estate planning documents. However, there's one thing that you can't put in a trust, and it's a big thing. It's guardianship of minor children. Obviously, anytime we're gonna designate uh, the guardianship of minor children, and that's when both parents would have passed away, there has to be court involvement. And that's what we would want, right? We don't want a piece of paper governing where children might live. So any type of a guardianship designation when it comes to minor children must be in a will, and it must be approved by a probate court. And generally, what courts will be looking at is what is in the best interest of the child. Uh, and there is generally a preference towards kinship placement, of course, to keep the children in the family. Uh, and this can be designated in your will. Um, if it's not in the will, then the court will have a hearing and anybody involved uh, can throw their hat in the ring uh, to look at what would be the best placement for these children. Uh, but if you put that designation in a will, generally, unless there is a problem, uh, the individuals either refuse or, or are unable to take care of the children, generally courts give preference to and will do the wishes of the decedent when it comes to the guardianship of their minor children. So even if you do have a trust, you're gonna to wanna to do a will, and a lot of these are called pour over wills. There's a will that kind of acts as a safety net, and it says that the beneficiary of this will is the trust. So if an asset falls outside of the trust, if it doesn't get titled in the trust name and put in the bucket, then this pour over will will catch it and pour the asset over into the trust to keep everything outside of probate. It's in this document where most people will include the designation of their guardian for their children. Now let's take a little detour and talk about powers of attorney. And there's generally two of these, and these designate people to act for you in the event that you're incapacitated. Now powers of attorney are effective from the date of your incapacity when it begins up until death. Uh, I see a lot of people make the mistake after somebody dies and says, well, I have their power of attorney. But powers of attorney are null and void after the death of the individual. They only are in play during their incapacity. Uh, and there's two types, as I mentioned, financial and health care. So if you can't make health care decisions for yourself, say you're out cold in the hospital, the health care power of attorney allows you to designate the person that can come in and make those health care decisions for you. And the same thing applies in the financial setting. You have a general durable power of attorney that allows somebody to come in and act for you financially in the event you're incapacitated, you're in the hospital, or in the event that you have dementia or Alzheimer's or some other situation which inhibits your ability to act financially for yourself. Now the creation of these documents are very similar to a will or a trust. It's in writing, usually typed up, signed by the maker, a witness by a couple of witnesses, however many the state requires, and then notarized by a notary public. And those are the basic estate planning documents that you need to prepare for uh, your uh, ultimate death and demise to make sure that your assets go uh, where you want them to go and to the beneficiaries that you designate and that you desire. But a lot of people will ask me this. They'll say, I don't have four or $5,000 to spend on an expensive estate plan. I don't even have that many assets. Is there something that I can do uh, in the short term to basically make sure my assets uh, stay out of probate and go to my family? And the answer is yes. 
Now we're talking about the area of beneficiary designations. And some lawyers call these tricks of the trades, but these are actually allowable uh, non-probate transfers that the laws allow in all 50 states. And the first of which is just a simple beneficiary designation. If we're talking about a life insurance policy, we're talking about a 401k or a retirement policy or any other type of a, uh, a retirement or investment account, there are beneficiary designations with the company right on the policy. And you can say, when I pass away, I want this to go to X or Y. You can have primary beneficiary. You can have a secondary beneficiary. And so uh, ultimately when you pass away, that doesn't have to go through probate. All the beneficiary has to do is basically fill out the form that the company requires, send in a death certificate, and then they get a check. Those type of assets don't need to be put into a trust and they don't have to be run through probate. They'll go directly to the beneficiary designated on the, on the account or policy. You can do the same thing with assets that are titled in accounts with the bank. Uh, you can simply do a TOD, which is transfer on death or POD, pay on death designation to all of those things. If it's a titled asset, you can go down to the DMV and you can POD or add somebody as a POD on your title. When you're talking about bank accounts, you can do the same thing. Now this is different than adding them as an owner of the account. If you add somebody as an owner, they will be able to uh, basically treat the account as their own. And I've seen kids added to bank accounts that have wiped them out. You don't want to do that. You just want to have these people added as a transfer on death owner. That means once you pass away, they go into the bank and give them the death certificate. Then and only then will they own the account and have access to your money. And last but not least, when we're talking about real estate, that's the area of beneficiary deeds. And it simply says that when I die, I want my property to go to X. Uh, this can be recorded within the chain of title and then whenever the individual does pass away, uh, all the beneficiary has to do is record their death certificate within the chain of title and they become the owner of the real estate. It is a very simple way to transfer property uh, without going through probate. Now the recipient of that property will uh, take that property subject to any liens. So if there's a mortgage on it, the beneficiary still has to pay that mortgage. They don't get out of that. However, they do become the owner of the property without that property having to go through probate. And the good thing is anyone can use these non-probate transfers, uh, whether you have a small estate or a large estate, but they are particularly good ways for people who have small estates to transfer their assets without going through the trouble and the expense of putting together an expensive estate planning package and or going through probate court. So that's your crash course on probate law, why we have it, what it is, the probate process, and then why you want to avoid probate if you can, and various means or tricks of the trade to allow you to do so. I wanna thank you for watching today's episode, and if you liked it, hit the like button. Uh, if you wanna know more about uh, legal topics in the law, uh, then I would encourage you to subscribe to the channel. If you got any questions, comment below, and as always, share me on social media. Again, thanks for watching. My name is Joshua Roberts, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money. Dad, get me out of this.